I'm Steve Orleans, president of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, and I'm thrilled today to be joined by an old friend, Professor Susan Shirk, who has just written a fabulous book. It is called Overreach, How China Derailed Its Peaceful Rise. Uh, Susan is research professor and chair of the 21st Century China Center at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at the University of California, San Diego, and is one of America's preeminent scholars on China. And when you read this book, you will know why she is one of the preeminent scholars on China. The book is truly a tour de force. It takes us through kind of China's policies over the last 15 years. It starts with kind of laying the foundation of where we were and then where we went to. In so many ways, she pulls back the curtain on how Chinese policy is made and not only tells you what the policy is, but explains why the policy was adopted. Um, it's full of nuggets where things that I didn't know, um, and I tend to know a little bit about China, but there were certainly things which I didn't know, which are throughout the book and that alone would make it worth the price of admission, in this case, the price of the book. Um, but it is truly a marvelous read with remarkable insight. So let me start with an easy question, which is, this has got an enormous amount of information. How many years did it take you to write this book? And what is your intended audience for the book? Well, Steve, thanks so much for this conversation. It's great to have a chance to talk with you about the book. And act I've learned a lot from you over the years. Um, and uh, maybe some of those specific points might even come up in our conversation. Uh, well, I started doing the research on the book in the mid 2000s. Uh, really around the time of the Olympics or shortly before the Olympics, because Chinese foreign policy and its domestic policy seemed to be changing in ways I didn't completely understand. I mean, just take uh, domestic social control and control over the media, for example. Things tightened up before the Olympics. And, you know, many of us thought, oh, well, that's very common before big events in China. There's a intensification of censorship and control over social behavior. Uh, but then afterwards, things will loosen up. But in the case of the this period, right before the Olympics and afterwards, things never loosened up again. So there was this important shift. We saw important shift in the state role in managing the economy and uh, perhaps most dramatically Chinese actions in the South China Sea. So all of these things were happening at the same time. I was puzzled by it. I tried to figure out what was going on, but the actual writing of the book, you know, I started much later, but I've been following this story ever since then. So around the Olympics, obviously yeah. the 2008 Olympics as opposed yeah. to the one that just that right. just right. that just was passed. And it, it's obviously a, it's a it's a real volume. If you were to kind of say what's the one takeaway you want the reader to have? Could you possibly kind of come to one takeaway? Um yes, you know, um the takeaway is that Chinese foreign policy and domestic policy are the result of the dynamics of domestic politics inside the black box of Chinese domestic politics. They're not predetermined. The path, China's path is not predetermined by the increase in its capabilities or by its history and tradition. It's much more open-ended and it all depends on domestic politics. And the book lays that out so 
interestingly and so comprehensively that really it's it is it intended to be by the way a course book you know a book that no. somebody uses if they're teaching kind of present day china no i i wrote the book for a broad audience of people who are interested in china business people um you know just um defense people anybody interested and concerned about China, but uh, like my previous book, uh, China Fragile Superpower, because it combines domestic politics and foreign policy, I found that it did get used quite a lot in college courses, even some high school courses. And of course, I'm hoping that happens again with this book. The um, You called the the book overreach and obviously the theory is that the chinese government policies have overreached i've often talked about uh chinese policy as overreaction as opposed to overreach and to me it's relevant because i think there there are policies that get adopted and then the chinese respond in some incredibly over they overreach in their response but there was an initial action. In fact, when you look at you know, the East China Sea, the South China Sea, the Hong Kong, Tibet, Xinjiang, uh, the technology, the crackdown on the technology platforms, the crackdown on tutoring, all of these were actually reactions to things which were occurring. So overreach or overreact? Well, I would say overreach and, and just to clarify what overreach means, what it means is taking things too far, doing things in an exaggerated manner in a way that then snaps back to harm yourself. So uh, harming yourself through uh, exaggerated action and you know, uh, policy making, of course, is reacting to the policies of other countries, what's happening on the ground in China in terms of changes in society. So all policy making is somewhat reactive. But then governments have choices. You know, how do they deal with the problems they face? And in the case of Chinese policy, before the mid 2000s, there was uh, what I would call a, a pragmatic and restrained approach, uh, especially to other countries in an effort to persuade the world that China's intentions were constructive and friendly even as its capabilities increased, uh, both its economic capabilities and its military capabilities. But after this time, you see a lot more bellicosity, a lot more provocative actions that actually alienated other countries. And similarly, the social control becomes a lot more rep repressive as well. Doesn't it lead, if it's a, overreach versus overreaction, doesn't it lead to different policy conclusions? So for instance, you talk about the, the beginning of the deterioration in the East, not the South China Sea, which was a drunken uh, Chinese fishing trawler ramming into a Coast Guard, mm -hmm. uh, a Japanese Coast Guard vessel. and. As opposed to in previous, they had a, the Japanese had a new government, and opposed to turning the pilot back over to the Chinese, they detained him for quite for some time, and the Chinese then overreacted to that. So it it kind of leads to almost a different uh, apportionment of fault. Well, you know, all of these uh, situations are interactive for sure. But because I was studying what had changed so dramatically 
my focus and because I'm a comparative politics scholar, I'm not, I've never actually taken an international relations course in my life. I just had the opportunity to serve in government and became fascinated by US-China relations in particular, uh, but also Chinese policies toward its Asian neighbors. So, uh, you know, so I was trying to look at the uh, roots, the drivers of China's policy making process. So my focus is on the China side, but of course, I understand that all of this is interactive. And I don't mean to say that all of the quote unquote blame should fall on China's side. Right, because one of the, it's always an interesting conversation. You have a, a piece that actually today came out on Taiwan, but one, of, and, and it, I think it's very nuanced and it understands. So one of the questions we're often discussing and the book uh, talks about this is when Tsai Ing-wen was elected and she, for political reasons, made a decision to go close to accepting the 92 consensus, but not getting there. And since then, we have, you know, the Chinese chose to kind of cut off uh, direct contacts with the Taiwan government, which I think was not the right decision. On the other hand, she did, for political reasons, decide not to accept what the previous president has accepted. So how do you kind of think about, you know, what happened there and how we should, we should think about those issues? Well, of course, I've been following uh, Chinese policy toward Taiwan for a very long time and was quite involved in it when I was in the State Department from 97 to 2000. And, you know, uh, the decision to cut off dialogue with the Taiwan government uh, because Tsai Ing-wen didn't utter the magic words exactly the way the Beijing government wanted it to, uh, seems to me to be incredibly short-sighted uh, in that it uh, really precludes the path of moving towards something that uh, the mainland government could call peaceful reunification. If you don't have any dialogue across the strait, you're going to alienate the people living on Taiwan, and you're going to make the need to uh, use force much more pressing and kind of box the mainland government into a corner. And I thought that all the more recently when in the white paper that the uh, Beijing published soon after Speaker Pelosi's visit, uh, they dropped the assurances to the people of Taiwan that under one country, two systems, Deng Xiaoping's approach at, for peaceful reunification, that they would not uh, have military forces or administrative government administrative personnel uh, located in Taiwan. Well, when you drop those assurances, to me, that was a very bad sign that it meant that uh, the mainland government was shutting off the path of peaceful reunification, which is a pretty uh, dangerous situation. And why do you think when, I guess it was the DPP's history, what made the, the Chinese, the mainland government choose that, you know, they really had two quite starkly different paths at that moment. And they chose one, which obviously was not in the interests of, 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 the United, of US China relations or cross strait relations. What drove that? Well, I think it's this kind of dogmatic approach to policy issues. Uh, and you know, it's rather ironic because this 92 consensus was originally a position that the Taiwan side had embraced and the mainland didn't. So it's not something that is um, 
somehow forever or uh, baked in to the needs of the PRC, it's all these government leaders can make choices. They can either choose to finesse the dogma and flexibly uh, have dialogue across the strait, or they can dig in their heels and say, you didn't utter the words just the way we wanted you to. And of course, it's completely unrealistic to expect any leader in Taiwan simply to say the magic words because Beijing wants it to. Because you cannot be a legitimate, especially democratically elected leader who simply uh, repeats the demands of uh, another government. So it, it, it's not a very effective way to solve the problem. And we, and as a result, we are where we are today, which is not great. Um, you've written extensively, and in the book talks about influence operations, and you say that that. Uh, the party's influence operation is to improve its image rather than to subvert democracy as opposed to Russia. Uh, do you think this is understood in the United States? I mean, you've been kind of writing about this for a while, very articulately. Well, probably not, but I'm not sure it actually makes that much difference. Because when you try to intrude into another country's domestic politics, you try to uh, I mean, we have public diplomacy, you know, we try to uh, persuade audiences in other countries, elite audiences, public audiences, that American policy is benevolent, makes sense, you know, has the interests of other countries at heart. And, you know, that's, that's fine. And certainly China will try to create a positive narrative about China as well. But um, when you treat people in other countries like they're your representatives in some way, especially overseas Chinese, then that's really exposing those people to a lot of suspicion uh, and endangering them. So I think uh, in the case, uh, I have a whole section in the book on overseas Chinese policy, which you see has really changed uh, under Xi Jinping in particular. The, uh, the book also talks about Confucius Institutes. Um, in, in a fair, you know, you basically give the data. Do you think the closing of those Confucius Institutes is good or not? I think the Confucius Institutes became a symbol in the United States and in other countries. Um, Confucius Institutes, I think, were relatively innocuous. However, I have been invited to speak at Confucius Institutes. Uh, many times on college campuses. And I say, well, what would you like me to talk about? You know, I can talk about uh, my research on China's domestic politics, or I can talk about US-China relations. They always say, talk about US-China relations. They do not want to host talks that might be too critical of China, for sure. So they're definitely was a kind of slant at Confucius Institutes that was more pro-China. However, mostly it was about teaching language. And I think, um, you know, it, we got a little too spun up about them. Uh, I think there are other activities that are much more uh, problematic than Confucius Institute. Yeah. Um, the, the book talks about, you know, the beginning of the Xi Jinping era in great detail. And, and one of the things kind of, I, 
your understanding kind of the internal workings. What was the third plenum of the 18th Party Congress about? This was the, the party, the plenum that proposed extraordinary economic reforms, having the market be the, the determining factor in Chinese economy. Obviously, of the, you know, we estimate that 90% were not implemented. Xi Jinping was already party secretary. What happened? Well, this is one of the issues that I've heard you talk about. Um, and I know that you're as mystified as I am about what it was all about. Because uh, when this, uh, this document came out, people were you know, quite encouraged about the reform orientation of the new Xi administration. Uh, certainly the description of how to manage a market economy was kind of straight out of a Western economics textbook, you know, uh, Samuelson or whatever. It was, it uh, envisioned quite a narrow, well-defined role for government and uh, advocated letting the market operate as a market. So what happened? I really don't know. I, I think when Xi Jinping took over, he was trying to appeal to all sorts of interest groups in society. And he, uh, this was one way that he appealed to the private sector and to coastal provinces. And uh, you might say the reformist coalition not just the control coalition, which I talk about in my book a lot, because that became very strong in the second term of Hu Jintao. Um, but then for reasons that I really do not understand, um, he basically didn't implement yeah. that impressive document. And so, um, you know, one of the things when I give advice to the Chinese side, that's one of the things I advocate, just go ahead and carry out the, what you pledged to do in that third plenum document. Any chance, it's funny, as, you know, the Chinese economy is obviously as a result of COVID policies, as a result of not implementing that reform, as a result of, you know, the real estate bubble bursting is in deep, trouble. Any chance that after the 20th Party Congress, we'll see some adoption of some of those reforms to increase economic growth? I mean, I think there's always a chance. I mean, one of my, my approach to China's uh, policy path is that, you know, um, all sorts of things could happen. And I don't want to preclude the possibility that Xi Jinping still has that pragmatic gene that all previous Chinese leaders have had. So yes, maybe it could happen because uh, all the economists are in agreement that that would be one very important way to restore the China's developmental dynamism. So, uh, but I think it's highly unlikely that anyone would say that, that that's what they're doing because actually the line in China is that they have carried out those reforms. So they can't, it's sort of like zero COVID. They can't admit the need for any change because they say that they already carried out the reforms. You expect the change in the zero COVID, the dynamic zero COVID policies after the 20th oh party God. Congress? I, I really don't know. Yeah. I really just don't know. I mean, the harm that it's doing 
to China, closing it off from the world. Uh, it's, it's the most unpopular policy that the Xi government has ever imposed, including all of the censorship, which is also unpopular. But this is highly unpopular. And you know, if you lose the support of the public, then the chances of a split in the leadership get much greater because these two risks are related to one another. And uh, up until zero COVID, the public was pretty supportive of Xi Jinping, which reduced the risk of a coup or a public split in the leadership. But if you sustain zero COVID, I think it's, uh, Xi Jinping will really be setting himself up uh, for a much riskier situation. In the book, you, you correctly say that Xi sees himself as waging a life or death struggle for the survival of party rule directed by foreign governments and organizations. Um, given kind of Secretary Pompeo's speech at the Nixon Library, not so far from San Diego, uh, given the Department of Commerce's uh, rules that came out this past Friday. I guess his, his view is getting more accurate as opposed to less accurate. Would you agree with that? Well, Pompeo's position is really an extreme one in the spectrum of American politics, even uh, despite this bipartisan consensus about the China threat, which definitely has led to more uh, tough policies that appear very hostile because they're costly to America itself. So it looks very hostile to the Chinese public as well as to the Chinese uh, policymakers. And that's one thing I'm certainly concerned about uh, because anti-Americanism hadn't really uh, been a major factor in China until really the um, Trump administration. And now that anti-Americanism I think is really a dangerous factor in US-China relations because it, um, it makes it harder for the Xi Jinping administration to make compromises with the United States should they choose to do so because they're gonna be facing some of that same uh, public pressure that they've always faced say vis-a-vis -vis Japan because of the anti-Japanese right. sentiment in, uh, in China. So, uh, you know, I, I think that the United States should be keeping that in mind. And as it makes its policies toward China, weighing the costs and benefits of different policies that we make, we should factor in. Uh, what impact it will have on Chinese public views toward the United States. Yeah, and also how it, yeah, I don't think we're doing a great job of weighing the costs and benefits. It's it's all about, you know, being harsh on China. I, I well, think, you know, I, I think I that's kind down. of, it's kind of the downside of bipartisan consensus. You know, everybody's kind of um, this hurting instinct, yeah. um, all headed in one direction. So I do think that we should pause and think long and hard about the impact on our own competitiveness uh, in some of the policies we're utilizing now. And, uh, you know, and also, as I say, think about the impact on public opinion in China. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's, um, 
we're punishing Americans to some degree because despite the administration saying we would have a multilateral approach, these rules are unilateral and I see no evidence that they'll be supported by the Brits, the Japanese, the South Koreans, the, the Dutch, um, which will just punish Americans, which is unfortunate. Well, I, you know, um, although I'm not completely positive about this latest round of tech policies, I do believe that semiconductors are one area and the manufacture of semiconductors that is just so important that it might be an exception to keeping our uh, market economy completely open uh, in this, in other areas of technology. I mean, I am a lot more concerned about seeing the restrictions bleed into biotech and so mm -hmm. many other technological domains. Whereas in the report that uh, UC San Diego 21st Century China Center did, um, together with Asia Society a few years ago, we did recommend that semiconductors just be carved out as for special treatment. So, you know, that may be necessary, but I don't support the broader technological decoupling that we're engaged in. Yeah. The book has a great list of, we need to wrap this up, but the book has a great list of policy recommendations uh, for China at the end. Uh, so I will encourage all our listeners to go out and buy it because then you could, because I'm not going to have Susan go through the whole list. It, okay. would, it would take too long, but let me close by asking the other side of that. Let, you know, we hope President Biden is going to meet with President Xi uh, in Bali in a few weeks. Mm -hmm. um, if you had two minutes with President Biden, uh, what would you tell him about Xi Jinping and China and what we should do? Well, I think we need to restore regular communication at all levels, including the leader level. And that we should uh, each side identify a short list of issues that they think are very, very important and amenable to possible give and take and resolution through diplomacy. So uh, I'd like to hear President Biden say to Xi Jinping, you know, we used to do, we used to accomplish a lot through our diplomacy. Let's make a, a big effort over the next two years to restore a more traditional diplomacy. Not a lot of meetings just for show, but let's let our publics know that we think we could solve some problems through diplomacy and uh, let's restore that diplomatic track. This conversation was intended to give our listeners a flavor of this wonderful new book written by Susan Shirk called Overreach. It is an absolute must read. Susan, thank you so much for writing this book, for being such a great friend and for contributing so much to the US-China relationship. Well, thanks, Steve, and thanks for all of the important work that the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations does.